you. I suppose that everybody came from that direction, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope you did. If, if you didn't, you went the wrong way. <laughs> down the whole time, you know, to go down. So basically, you know, it took me a while. Uh, we, we only began to do in earnest uh, tours over here, what? You buffs can tell me two, three, four years yeah. ago, something like that. We started, um, you know, I started having to learn it more. Um, it's intimidating. Culp's Hill, with all the different monuments layered, like when you go around this curve right here, we see the cars and so forth. And, uh, oh, this is nice. There's no cameras. I can walk, right? So uh, I love to pace. That never comes out on camera. I like to just do circles. <laughs> But I think like that. But uh, the monuments which you see off in the distance, you've got 6th Corps, you've got 12th Corps. You looked around here, you might even find some Confederate monuments. You know, you got 2nd Corps troops coming into this area from the Union Army. You know, you've got all these different maneuvers. So what basically is the terrain and how does it evolve into the battlefield? So when you came from this direction <coughs> over here, Spangler Springs, you parked your, some of you had to park all the way back there, I suppose. Y'all were walking, what, did you? Is that that long? All the way back to the bathroom? Yeah? All right. Uh, if you, instead of walking back that way, you actually might could go this way if you need a shortcut. It'll be downhill, too, once you get on the other side. So anyway, Spangler Springs, if you think about like a staircase, let's use a staircase right here. Spangler Springs is your floor area. And as you start to ascend on the tool road, you're going to be going through different plateaus. Harry Fonz in his book um, refers to them as saddles, if you will. If you think how a saddle, you know, comes up and down. And if you look where we are right now, you can sort of see the saddle. The ground, of course, you know this from driving it, is, is lower on the other side of this tree line. Mm -hmm. It then comes up to this ridge right here, and if you look behind you, it drops off. Where you see that car going around the curve right there. And if you look off in the distance, you can see it ascending again. So it's a series of plateaus that go all the way up to the top. I had a gentleman here about 30 minutes ago, and he came up to me and he asked, where's the tower? I said, well, it's at the summit. And he goes, I'm not at the summit? <laughs> and I go, no. He goes, which way's the summit? <laughs> you know, and he's turned around backwards. Well, that's the same way these Civil War soldiers were. They don't know where they are. They don't know how they got there and what they're doing. So, <clears throat> let's start with big picture. Better, ladies and gentlemen, are coming from this direction, not this direction. In other words, it's not all pretty for you. It's not all, you know, straight lines and everything is, is equal distance and all this. No, all right? Let's make these people seated right here. Perfect. You couldn't have par parked yourself any better. Uh-oh. Right here. All right. <laughs> there you go. I'll get back to you in a minute. I just saw you. All right, so... Now all it needs is Johnny, right? It'll be all right. <laughs> the Confederates are starting where uh, Nick Saban is. Okay? <laughs> and so, coach. And so, uh, here's Culp's Hill, lady with the U.S. flag. The Confederates, therefore, are attacking this way. All right? They're not attacking this way. All right, so what does that mean? What's the big point, Matt? So, last night we were shooting off some fireworks and uh, you know you can have hang fires if you will you know where they they you know pause for a couple of seconds and they'll start going again well the way that ba basically the battle on Culp's Hill unfolds mm -hmm. is it's like a door and it's closing like this it swings shut well obviously if this is the wall the the right flank that is closest Confederate right flank, I'm reversed from you, that is closest to the Union line is going to get engaged first. So what I'm saying, like those fireworks I was popping last night, as the Confederates, as the fighting breaks out over here, you start shooting at me and so forth, and then I hear it, I'm over here, and I hear it, well, I'm coming to your help, you know. That Confederate division under Allegheny Johnson is going to swing like a door. And where we're getting site-specific right here and getting into party field right here, 
I already told you that the, once again, I'll tell you for the third time, that the end of the New Yorker's line is right here to your left. Well, <clears throat> these Confederates stretch all the way out to Spangler Spring. All the way out there. And if these Confederates are coming in and attacking by brigade one at a time, in real time what that would mean is 1st Brigade goes in. 2nd Brigade turns, dresses their line, goes in. All this is taking time. And that 3rd Brigade, as it comes in, well, they're swinging and they're hearing firing, but, but they've also got the problem of trying to have to anchor their flank on the 2nd Brigade, right? This is all very hard to do. Oh, and you're in the woods, <laughs> okay? <laughs> trying to do Napoleonic tactics in the woods. <laughs> Yeah, right. Other than that, though, I think it's perfect. <laughs> but the, the brigade on the end is Marilyn Stewart. Not to be mistaken with Jeb Stewart. All right, Marilyn. It's even spelled different if you look it up. Uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. There you go. So um, Stewart's brigade is going to be on the tail end, and where we're standing right here, they literally walk in the Spangler Springs, and the and the Union campfires are still smoldering. And they're like, well, this is interesting. <laughs> Where are they? <laughs> and um, the 12th Corps that's been sent away, well, they're told to come back and reoccupy their old position. Well, their old positions are here. There's only one problem with that. They're occupied. They're occupied, and these tenants don't want to move. <laughs> And they're very forceful about it, okay? And they're not open to negotiations. So today I'm gonna to discuss one key moment uh, right here of the fighting that took place 160 years ago on July 3rd, uh, here at the high water mark on Cemetery Lake. So, for the U.S. soldiers who are defending this ground here on July 3rd against the, the attacking Confederates in what became known as Pickett's Charge, these U.S. soldiers were determined to defend the very last inch of this ground until the very last moment uh, or die trying and they attempt to do so. Now, if we look off to our left behind us there, we have the statue of General George Meade, the U.S. commander here during the Battle of Gettysburg. Meade believes that we, who we can see uh, behind uh, the cannons here off in the distance in the woods, there's the Virginia Memorial. That's where the Confederate lines are along the woods of Seminary Ridge. Meade believes that Lee is going to launch similar attacks to what he did the day before on July 2nd. So if you are familiar with the setup on July 2nd, I know it's a little hard for people to see, but you can see that the blue line here is shaped in the in the shape of a fish hook or a candy cane. Um, all along Seminary Ridge or Cemetery Ridge is where we are, um, where it says um, Newton and Hancock. Uh, so Meade is positioned, um, his line looping around Culp's Hill behind the visitor center, uh, off of Baltimore Pike in the distance. Wraps around Cemetery Hill, where you would have passed the National Cemetery today. Loops down Cemetery Ridge and down to Little Round Top there, where we can see the big uh, wooded hills there. You can see a bit of a clearing, uh, some monuments. That's Little Round Top. Uh, so the Union has held a very strong defensive position on the second. But Meade believes that Lee is going to try to attack both ends of this line again, as he did on the second attacking Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, and while, while attacking the southern end of the line, uh, down at the end of Cemetery Ridge, or off, um, coming off of the Peach Orchard. Uh, if everyone looks in the distance, we can see the red barn uh, furthest ahead of us here. Uh, to the left of that is the Sharpie Peach Orchard. So the Confederates have uh, artillery placed there. Confederate General Robert E. Lee believes that the second day has earned some gains for the Confederate Army uh, as they have control of the Peach Orchard and have some cannons placed there. They have gained a foothold at the base of Culp's Hill by the end of the second, um, and they have control of some of these 
uh, roads here in Gettysburg. So Meade believes that the attack will come um, at this spot here on Cemetery Ridge. So one of his first four commanders was the one tasked with leading this charge here, Longstreet, doubts the feasibility of an attack here on Cemetery Ridge, looking at these open fields behind us here. He will tell me tell Lee that it is in my opinion that no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position here on Cemetery Ridge. Still, Lee is determined to launch that attack and will begin to put uh, movements in place for that, cannons in place along Seminary Ridge and the woods behind us. Now back here on Cemetery Ridge, U.S. soldiers are preparing for an attack that could come here. For many men, it is all quiet here, and that will all change, however, at around 1 o'clock, when 150 cannons all along the woods in front of us on Seminary Ridge will open fire on Cemetery Ridge here. And that cannonade will last at least an hour and a half. Our U.S. artillery has about 100 cannons to match that, so you can imagine 250 cannons going off between either sides. As many of the men here on Cemetery Ridge are forced to lie flat to the ground to avoid being hit uh, by shells being launched at them by the enemy. Meanwhile, the infantry are watching their artillery here, uh, busy manning the guns. Once the cannonade comes to a halt around 3 o'clock or so that afternoon, first line of Confederates will emerge from the woods behind us here, initiating what becomes Pickett's Charge. Named so after the Virginia Division led by George Pickett um, and Longstreet's Confederate Corps. Right as they're emerging from the woods, there will be 12,000 Confederates coming across about three quarters of a mile of this open ground here versus about half their number, 6,000 infantry and some artillery men and those hundred cannons. Now there are, uh, it's kind of hard to see today, but there are swales and dips in the ground here that will protect some of the Confederates as they're coming into view. Now, after a report to the battle, some Confederates will say that they're aiming for a group of trees, uh, which will become known as the infamous Copse of Trees, um, just over to our left there. Now besides charging across this mainly open field, the Confederates will have another obstacle. If we look behind us, there's the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, there's fences along that road as well. So when they get to that fence line, they either have to go around the fence, tear it down, or kind of hop over it as well. Now the Union artillery and infantry are busy uh, trying to defend this ground here, taking uh, aim at the Confederates coming forward. And many of the soldiers will witness, uh, many of the Confederates don't even make it uh, to the road itself. One Ohio officer, uh, who's actually with the 8th Ohio there, standing at the road after fire firing a volley um, into the side of the Confederates, watched his quote, hats, guns, legs, arms, and mutilated carcasses flew up in the air um, as the Confederates were moving forward. Many of those Confederates, again, will not make it even to the road, but will fall back to Seminary Ridge or will be taken prisoner. We're here for Farnsworth's Charge, which is one of the mo more, what would you say, uh, understudied? Is that the word for it? Uh, actions in the entire Battle of Gettysburg. It is overshadowed, ladies and gentlemen, by Pickett's Charge. And well, it should be. I mean, with the numbers produced and the, and the, and the uh, potential outcomes for everything, I mean, it just kind of gets swept under the rug. But nevertheless, with the repulse of Pickett's Charge is what's going to set up Farnsworth's uh, attack on July 3rd. And Calvary is going to show up or I should say, not show up, but start to put pressure on this Confederate line, which is on this end over here. Okay, so Farnsworth and his men, regardless, the Union cavalrymen, beyond a doubt, blast their way through the Confederate line facing this way, punch a hole in the line, and they ride out into the valley. They're here, they've broken through, but there's no plan. And the organization, the unit composition, has fallen apart. So what do you do? They, they mingle, they basically, the way it sounds like, like a mixing bowl 
all those different units, or I should say battalions, 1st West Virginia, 1st Vermont, those men, miscellaneous men, are mingling down here by the Slider Farm and out here behind Devil's Den. We have accounts of Georgians shooting at them from Devil's Den. So I know that they had to come close enough behind Devil's Den to, for them to shoot at them. 4th Alabama, once they come through here, the 4th Alabama starts running down through here. As Law said, they're running. There's no battle line. And I can't, they either were shooting at them when they went through the first time, I believe so, but they weren't ready, meaning they weren't set up. But the second time they came back, it's pure dances with wolves. They're ready this time. And so those 4th Alabama is positioned along that stone wall and thundering up here, put it in your ears, thundering up that trail right here is going to be the Union Cavalry. Can you imagine standing here? Um, Oates is going to advance. He's going to be positioned like this. He's going to reverse his command and come in like this. He will have skirmishers out front of him, just like battle formation. So the Alabamians that the... That the Union soldiers talk about meeting in this field are probably from the 15th Alabama, from that skirmish line. <laughs> <laughs> Barnsworth either die. Barnsworth either goes down right here, in a nutshell, they either go down right here, where obviously you've read this monument so far, or it may have been another Union writer named Captain Cushman who was wearing a gold, excuse me, a white fringe jacket with gold trim that had been made to him by the hands of a lady, which she said no bullet could penetrate. <laughs> Barnsworth, before, excuse me, before Cushman charged, he put a silk handkerchief over his head to keep the sun off, and that is who Law says, describes that he saw dashing through the field. So the debate, in conclusion, is was it Barnsworth that was up here and was and shot himself? Or was it anybody? Or was it Captain Cushman who was mistaken for Farnsworth and brought? In conclusion, Farnsworth's uh, star from his jacket, which was actually Alfred Pleasanton's old uniform, was cut off the insignia, was cut off and given to Law, or excuse me, to Colonel Oates. And that was in the Alabama governor's office in the post-war years, Farnsworth star. So I think beyond a doubt, Farnsworth dies in this field. Whether he shot himself is up to interpretation. Thank you for watching our video. Please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. And if you have any suggestions for future videos, please leave those in the comment section. We'll work on getting them out to you as soon as possible.